Thanks for engaging this message and watching it and having a heart to learn and grow in your relationship with God. But before the message gets started, I wanna lay in front of you a couple convictions that are on my heart. Conviction number one is for those folks who go to Grace Fellowship. If you attend one of our campuses, I wanna make sure that you understand that watching messages online or on your phone shouldn't be seen as a substitute for actually attending a service. It's so important that you get to a service, you participate in the singing and the giving and even the serving as you interact with other individuals at that campus. And so we wanna make sure that you get to a campus as soon as you can. And then I also wanna share a conviction for those of you that don't go to Grace. While we love that you're engaging the teachings here, we wanna make sure that these teachings are just seen as supplementary to the teachings that you're getting from your primary pastor or your pastoral teaching staff at your church. So it's so important that you sit under their leadership and their authority and the teachings God has given them. With that in mind, I look forward to what God's gonna do in this message. Hope that you enjoy it and that God stirs your heart as you grow in your relationship with Him. Christmas and let me welcome you to Grace. Thank you so much for being here. It really does mean a lot that you would choose to spend part of your Christmas Eve and Christmas season with us. I don't take it for granted at all that you would make the time and prioritize being here. So thank you. And we're going to do our best to make this as uh, effective and as useful for you uh, as we can. I know that when it comes to this part of the service, particularly a part where someone's going to talk at you and teach at you, there's a lot of emotions that go off inside of people's souls. There are some of you that love Christmas and the Christmas story and the idea of Jesus. And so you're just all ears and excited and can't wait to hear and be reminded of what you love. There are some of you that are guests of certain people and you don't know what to expect. You're a little bit uneasy and you're here because you love the person that brought you and you're just not really sure. There are some of you, you're here because you love your mother and your mother said so. And so you have to be here. There are some of you who are here because you started dating a cute boy or a cute girl and they said, we go to church on Christmas Eve. And so that's what you're doing. And yet there's just some of you that if we're honest, and I don't, I don't mean this in a rude way at all, it's just Christmas and so you go to church. You don't even really know why, but you go to church because it's Christmas and it's what you do. I wanna ask you to consider something that if there is a very real God, and there is a God who put this whole Christmas thing together, is it possible that you're actually here because he has something to say to you? Is it possible, would you consider the reality that the organization of your life and the people that you know and the circumstances brought you to this place at this time so that maybe God would actually say something to you? And so I wanna ask you to do something, whether this is the first time you've been at a Christmas Eve service or you've been at one pretty much your entire life every Christmas Eve, I want you to lean in and listen in like it's the first time you've ever heard any of this. And I'll, I'll do my best to be as, as clear and as concise in trying to explain what it is that I think we need to explain. We've been in the last few weeks here at Grace in a series where we've been talking about the Christmas season. And we've really tried to stay at a 30,000 foot perspective even before the idea of Christianity and say, why is it 
that so many people really love this time of the year and that they have kind of extra juice in their step. They're, there's passion and enthusiasm, joy. They have Christmas cheer. And, and you know who you are if that's you. You're the people that as soon as Thanksgiving ends, you can't wait to get the tree up. You can't wait to get the Christmas movies on, the Christmas music on the radio. You can't wait to decorate and do all things. And, and, and when I think about you, I just think, what's wrong with you? Why are you like that? Um, I, I say that a little bit sarcastically, but, but the truth is those folks that have been around at Grace for a while know that even though I'm, I'm a pastor and, and, and Christmas is a big deal, I struggle sometimes to have a lot of Christmas cheer. There's a lot that goes on that can be difficult to process. And so what we wanted to do this Christmas season was to take a look at people who have great Christmas cheer and say, Why? Beyond, again, potentially the idea of Jesus, what is it that certain people look at and see and think about that allows them to have the cheer that they have? And so as we've been going through this, we, we've talked about a few things. We said the first thing that a lot of people said was traditions. They love that Christmas is a time where they get to do things that they used to do as a kid or they get to do every year. And those traditions do something in their soul. Then other people said what they really love is they love the people they get to be with. They get concentrated, focused time with the people that are most important to them. Maybe even people that are with them right now. And they just love that. Other people couldn't necessarily put it into words, but what they described was kind of the vibe of Christmas. Almost like a snow globe coming to life. This just spirit of generosity and joy and passion and enthusiasm. And, and they just said they love the way that it makes them feel. There's no other time of the year that makes them feel that way. And I think those are all viable and all real in all ways that people feel Christmas cheer. In fact, at the beginning of the service, there was a video where lots of people were asked, what is it you love about Christmas? What is it that brings you joy and passion about Christmas? And I think all of them were honest and said really good things, but I actually think there was one particular person who was the most honest out of any of them. And it was my five-year-old son, and he said this. He said, presents. <laughs> Unprompted, unfiltered, when they ask Cooper, Cooper, what do you love about Christmas? He said, I love me some gifts. Now, if you've got a program, I want you to follow along and let's just be honest for a second. You may say, well, he's just a five-year-old and he's immature, but I would say out of the mouth of babes often comes the truth. Because this is the reality for why some of us will have Christmas cheer. You're gonna get some great gifts. Now, we're, we're all too mature to say that, right? We're all too proud and it sounds shallow, but this is the only time of the year for some of you where you're gonna get cool stuff. You're, you're gonna get the clothing item you've been wanting, the collectible that you've been longing to get. Someone's gonna get you the autograph thing. You're gonna get an experience purchase for you. Grandma or your mom or your dad or your in-laws or your spouse or your kids, you're gonna get some great stuff and you're gonna be excited because there's no other time during the rest of the year where you get good stuff. And you're like, I like Christmas because I get good stuff. I get presents. Now, when I was growing up and as I've heard people talk, people say, when it comes to presents, it really doesn't matter what you get because it's a thought that counts. That's a lie. That is not true at all. That is not true at all. In fact, here's what you're gonna know tomorrow or whenever you open presents, ready? Not all gifts are created equal. They're just not. Now you can tell me I'm supposed to be as excited about socks as I am an Apple Watch, I'm not. You can tell me I'm supposed to be thrilled about the mug that I got from my kids with Santa's face on it versus a trip to Disney. They're not comparable in my mind, right? There, there are certain gifts that are, just, that are just better. You can go ahead and judge me. You feel the same way. You know this is true, that, that in your soul, you're like, man, some gifts are better than other gifts. And you know that when you open stuff tomorrow, some of you are gonna be like, great, a spatula, socks, right? But there are other times where you get stuff and it's like, man, that was incredible. Well, the question is, why is that? Why, why are some presents that we get better than other presents? Why are some presents more memorable? Well, there's a lot of reasons I could suggest to you. I wanna give us maybe three to consider that I think are true about the gifts that we love, great gifts that we get in our life. I think, I think the first thing that's true about great gifts is they're, they're personal. Someone knew us well enough to know what it is we would love. They knew our favorite color, they knew our favorite team. They knew our favorite brand, our favorite author. 
They remember that time we were out on date night and we were at the mall and we saw that thing and they made a note in their phone and they went and got that. They remember the time we went to that concert and how powerful and meaningful that was. And so they bought us another one of those experiences. And it's personal. They know you. They were able to look and say, this isn't for everybody. This is for you. There's a lot of things you can buy anybody, but they knew what to get you. It was very personal. I think the second thing that is true about a great gift is it's lasting. There's something about it that goes beyond the fad. It's, just, it's not just the great Christmas present of this year. It, it, it lasts. And maybe it lasts because it's actually just like really something that's durable or maybe it's because of an experience or the memory that it creates, but, but it goes beyond. My wife and I had this debate about when I buy her flowers. She thinks it's nice and she likes them and she likes the way they make the house smell and look, but she'll often say to me, honey, they die really quick. And she'll, she'll joke with me about like, let's get something that's gonna carry on because there is something about the idea of not just something that's personal, but something that's lasting, something that's sustaining, something that goes on. And then the third one, we don't like to say it, but something that's costly. And I don't just mean price, but sometimes I do mean price. Sometimes the person had to save up. Really at the heart of this is sacrifice, right? They waited in line. They did the research. They went and asked somebody else who had one of these. They did pay a lot of money. They went and found that player and got that thing signed for you. There was a cost to it. There was a sacrifice to it. I think about a gift in my life that I got one time that was personal, that's been lasting and that was costly, that was really, really great for me, was when my wife bought me a meat smoker. <laughs> So she bought me this meat smoker because she knows personally that I, I love to cook and I love large chunks of cooked animal flesh, like a lot. And she's like, if we can bring those two things together, I think we got something here. And so she, she knew me and so she, she started to do the work and, and then she went and it's lasting and, and I, this is gonna sound really like ridiculous, but that meat smoker's changed my life, guys. Some of the best memories I have now with friends and family and people are because of something that was smoked in that and the way that that's driven conversations and it's been lasting. It's gone on for years and we, we keep it and it's been really something that's been sustaining beyond just the fact of when we got it. And then it cost her. She had to do some research. She had to find out what brand. She had to go talk to some people who own some. She's a small girl. It's a big thing. She had to figure out how to get it to the house and all that kind of stuff. And, and it cost her. And, 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 and you probably are sitting here and you're thinking about a gift in your life where you would say it was personal. It was lasting. It was costly. And it made it a great gift. It made it something that you were so excited about. Now, if you're paying attention and you know you're in church and it's Christmas Eve, you're, you're saying, I, I see this. I see the setup. He's gonna switch at any moment now from the idea of gifts that are materialistic to the gifts of Jesus. I know that's what he's going to do. This is the moment. You're right, this is the moment. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm going to do. And none of you should be surprised because you're in a Christian church on Christmas Eve where we believe really substantial things about Jesus. And what I'm about to say is incredibly cliched and it's certainly cliched for this time of the year, but just remind yourself of something. Just because something is cliched doesn't mean it's any less true. In fact, let me say it to you this way. I would believe that Jesus is the greatest gift you're ever gonna get. Amen. That the greatest gift you're ever gonna get in life is the person of Christ. And I know you think, well, that's what you're supposed to say because you're the, the pastor and it's Christmas and, and Jesus is the reason for the season. And I would push back on that and I would say, no, Jesus isn't the reason for the season. Jesus is the reason for everything. And Jesus is the greatest gift you're ever gonna receive. Jesus is the greatest thing that's ever gonna come because here's the truth about what Christmas says. Christmas says that God gave you the gift of himself. God gave you Emmanuel. He gave you God with us. God gave you his presence. And when you think about what that means and the implications of that, I wanna to suggest to you as we consider this idea of God being a gift giver and Christmas being a gift, we should think about how we engage that gift. In fact, the, the idea of God giving the gift of his son shows up in the Bible multiple times. And for those of us that are Christians, we lean into the Bible, we trust the Bible. It's our source to understand how to follow and pursue this God that we believe has been revealed in arguably the most well-known Bible verse in all of human history that has become popularized, it says this in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he, everyone say this word, yes. that he gave. That he gave his one and only son. That, that what Christmas was, was God giving us a present. And the present was his kid. 
And then he sent his son so that whoever would believe in him, whoever would put faith in him, would not perish but have eternal life. In other words, that your eternity would be secure because of your trust in this present, this great gift that is Jesus. There was another author in scripture that was thinking about the person of Jesus. And when he described Jesus, this is the way he described him. He said, thanks be to God the Father for the indescribable gift. I can't even put words, this author says, to explaining who Jesus is and what he means and what he's about. And then if you fast forward a little bit more and we start to think about the idea of Jesus being sent and the gift that he is, what is it that he ultimately offers as a gift to us? And here's what it says in Ephesians, another letter to a small community in the ancient Mediterranean. For it is by grace, this is the idea, that no person earns their relationship with God, that they receive it through the, the grace of God by something that they didn't earn, but something that is given to them. For it is by grace you have been saved, and we'll get to this, through faith, you put your trust in it. And this is not from yourselves. This is not anything you've done. This isn't your your spiritual exercise to be able to earn. This is your righteousness, your morality. And then he, he says this, and I love this. It is the gift of God that Jesus, the son of God, would show up and offer you this gift of salvation that you could have in your life. And then I love it. Not by works so that no one can boast. (laughs) He says, no one can take credit for Christmas. No one can take credit for the crucifixion. No one can take credit for the resurrection. See, friends, at the end of the day, at the center of our faith is not us. That's why we don't celebrate ourselves. It's why we worship a king. Because ultimately it's all about him and what he has done. It's about this gift. It's about God gifting himself to us. It's about Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus showing up, showing us the process of God's radical pursuit to go rescue humanity back. You know, as we consider the gift of Jesus and we begin to think about it and look at it, I want us to consider those same words that I said would be true about a gift to you. A gift that's personal, a gift that's lasting, a gift that is costly. And I want to connect those to these verses that we just looked at. And I want to give you a few thoughts to consider as you think about how Jesus is personal, how Jesus is lasting, and how Jesus is a gift that is costly. And to do that, I'm going to take some words that are found in those passages and connect one word to each of them. And so the word that I want us to think about, about the gift of Jesus, when we think about him being personal, is I want you to think about the word Savior. I want you to think about the word Savior. It says in Luke chapter two, the familiar story about Jesus's birth. Today in the city of David in Bethlehem, you'll find a child and that child that is born is the Lord, is the Messiah, is the Savior. See, when God sent his son, he didn't send a politician, he didn't send a musician, he didn't send an athlete, he didn't send an IT specialist, he didn't send a doctor, he didn't send a mechanic. He sent a Savior because we needed saved. He sent it someone who could actually deal with the personal need that we all have. And this is where where many of us begin to part company with me in this time on Christmas Eve because the reason we need a savior is because we're sinners. That's not a popular thing to say in our culture. In fact, some of you would say, no, 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 no. What's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. And I'll hear you say a lot of things, but you're not gonna call me a sinner. You might admit that you're a mistaker. You might admit that you have regrets. You might admit that you make bad decisions. You might admit that you're selfish and at times don't get it right, but you would hesitate very much to say, I am a sinner in need of being saved. In fact, if you're someone who's a theist, which basically means you believe in God, Most theists would say, well, I believe God created the world and I believe God wants people to be good and I believe that God is probably holding everything together and I believe that God has people go to heaven and I believe all these things about God and power and storms and rain and all these things. But where you part company is the idea that God would say, you're guilty of cosmic treason before him. That you're actually separated based on what you've done. Now, what's interesting is, I think some of the reasons that we believe this are not just because our culture doesn't want to talk about sin. I think it's because we elevate our own goodness and we downplay the holiness of God. We don't understand how holy God is. We don't see how amazing every attribute of his is that is perfect. And then we elevate our goodness by comparing it to other people. But but be honest, if there's a perfect God who really is holy, you know you don't measure up. And you know how I know that? You don't even measure up to your own standards. 
In the last year, you were totally committed to being more generous. And you're probably not. In the last year, you said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna learn to be way more patient with the kids. And you haven't. In the last year, you said, I'll stop lying. You still lie. Because the truth is, not only do we not measure up to the standards of God, we don't even measure up to what we want to be. And yet God shows up and he says, I'm perfect. And to be in a relationship with me, you need to be perfect. And then some of you say, I knew it. God's out to get me. He's angry with me. He's probably scowling in heaven, looking down at me. This is why I don't want anything to do with church. This is why I'm even skeptical of the whole Christmas thing because I don't want a God who all he wants to do is come after me and get me. And then I would say this to you. While many of you know John 3, 16, you, you don't keep reading. Because John 3, 17, after it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John three seventeen says this, for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it. God didn't have Christmas happen because he was out to get you in a bad way. God had Christmas happen because he was out to get you in a good way. In fact, look at what it says. It says he didn't come to condemn it, but to save the world through him. See, the reason Jesus is the greatest gift is you need a savior and so do I. And not just like a savior in theory, but you need a personal savior. Someone who can deal with your garbage. Someone who can deal with your past, your regrets, your doubts, your failures, your concerns, your questions. And the good news is God is with us. The present shows up in his personal. It's not just for your grandma or just for some subset of people. It's for you. It's personal. He says, this is how you would be saved because you need a savior. It's personal. The second thing about Jesus as a gift, when you think of the word lasting, I want you to think of the word eternity. I want you to think of the word eternity. He says, if you would believe upon him, you would have eternal life. Christmas reminds us that the stakes for our conversation are not 80 years. They're not a good childhood or a moral childhood. They're not great years of retirement. They are your entire eternity. In fact, according to the Bible, you're not a body. You're a soul that has a body. And your soul will go on to live somewhere forever. And what God wants to come and do is he wants to give you that eternity with him. But the only way you get it with him is through him. And you, you might even sense this already, that you believe in some form of, of something greater than this life. I'll give you two reasons. Most of us, even if we're not sure what we believe, we're pretty confident that death isn't the end of our life. We look around and we think, I'm pretty sure there's something. I don't even know exactly what it is. I don't know how to put my hands on it, but I'm pretty sure because you long for longer. And then here's the other thing I know. You long for your life to have meaning. You long for legacy. You hate the fact that you go to your job every day and you feel like it doesn't do anything. You hate the fact that you feel like part of your life is meaningless. You hate the fact that it feels like you're just wasting your time and nothing you do really matters. And you know why that's there? You know why you long for longer? You know why you long for legacy? Because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter three that eternity was placed inside of your heart. That you long for something more than this life. It's why every young person wants to be a YouTube sensation or every Gen Xer wanted to be a rock star because you wanted to be known. You wanted to matter. You wanted something that was beyond this moment in life. And Jesus shows up and says, you can have that. You can have eternity. You can have something that is lasting. Jesus says, yes, I change your life incrementally. Yes, I make your life better. Yes, I make you better at life. But beyond that, I change you to be like me for eternity. It's not only personal, it's lasting. He's not only the savior, he offers you eternity. And then the third word that I want you to think about as it relates to costly is the word grace. Is the word grace. For it is by grace you have been saved. See, you recognize, or if you recognize that you're separated from God, you begin to realize that there's no way you can work your way to God. But what you soon realize is that the Christmas story is a reminder of God working his way to us. I think about the illustration many times I've done this with my sons where they've wanted to dunk a basketball. 
but they're not big enough to dunk a basketball. And so we're around a hoop. So I pick them up and I take them to a place where they can do what they couldn't do on their own. Jesus coming to earth and dying for us is him saying, by way of the cross, in faith, through grace, I will take you to a place you could never go on your own. It's him picking us up. It's him saying, I'm gonna come and make a way because you couldn't earn it. You can't be religious enough. I will give it to you. I will give you my righteousness. I will give you grace. And grace had a cost. It meant God had to take his son and put on skin and his son could become someone who would be mocked, someone who would be beaten, someone who would be flogged, someone who would be killed. In fact, if you, if you really wanna understand the cost of grace, then you need to come think about what we talk about at Easter. You got to think about the fact that grace wasn't cheap. It wasn't free. It cost God his son so that we could have a relationship with him, which is why I'm reminded that the greatest present you will ever get is not a present you find under the tree. It's a person who hung on a tree. It's why Jesus is the greatest gift because he shows up and he meets you in your greatest need personally, you. He gives you something that lasts forever, eternity, and he does it in a way where it costs him. It's grace. Now, now this is the thing. I've done this long enough that people listening in, there's only one of two reactions. There's not a third reaction. There's not a third door. And it's the same reaction that you have when you open your presence tomorrow. You're gonna feel one of two ways about this message and about the presence you're gonna get. And so your reaction is one of two things. This gift of Jesus is neat, that's neat, or it's necessity. There's some of you, you hear it and you go, that's neat. That's good. Glad I was reminded of that. That's, that's great, that's neat. It's the same way you'll react tomorrow when you open up T-shirts. That's neat. It's great. But if I handed you your mortgage for a year, you'd respond very differently. If I handed you your kid's college tuition, you'd respond very differently. If I paid your car off, you'd respond very differently because you would look and you would say necessity. And I'll tell you the line of scrimmage between your two reactions, between neat and necessity. They come down to one word and it's the word desperation. How desperate are you for that gift? Imagine I offered a glass of water to someone. I can tell you the way they will take that water is dependent upon the situation to which they're coming from, which demands how much they are desperate for the water. If we're at a hangout and we're all at someone's house and we're just talking and playing Pictionary, they'll simply take the water. They'll drink it casually. They won't spill it. They won't gulp it. They'll just take it in in a very dignified way. But if the person just got done with a CrossFit workout or was coming across the desert and you handed them water, they wouldn't care how they drank it. They would get every last bit of it in their mouth as fast as they could because they're desperate for it. It's interesting that Jesus, when he refers to himself, he says, I offer you water that is everlasting that you will never ever thirst for again. But the only way you drink it is if you're desperate for it. So this Christmas, the question is, is it, is it neat? That's cool. Or is it necessity? I have to have it. And as it relates to responding to that, it's just like any present. If someone gives you a present tomorrow and you put it in your hands and you shake it and you look at it, here's what you know. And I'll just say it to you this way. This present doesn't become real until you do something. You can't experience a gift until you open it. You can't actually experience what's in the box until you open it. I, I wanna say this in the most gracious but honest way I can say it. You are not a Christian and okay with God because you know and understand the Christmas story. I know lots of people who hate God who know the Christmas story. I know lots of people who want nothing to do with God who know the Christmas story. You are only a Christian when by desperation, you come to a place where you say, the gift of Jesus is a necessity I must have and I will open it. And here's what I know, that type of claim that you need Jesus is highly offensive. It's offensive to you if you're maybe on the left politically, it's offensive to you if your ideology is to think that way because the idea that anyone would say anybody or anything is exclusive bothers you. 
It's also offensive if you're on the right side of the aisle and maybe you think a little bit more with that ideology because what that thing says is there's no way that you can do it in and of yourself to earn it. And it also says that the good people are as in much need as the bad people. Because you know what Christianity says? Christianity says self-salvation doesn't work. Nobody can save themselves. Everybody's in the same place, which is they need Jesus. So people hear that, it's neat. The other group of people say it's necessity, and I'll tell you who those people are. They're the people that have come to a place in their life where they say, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm, I'm stuck in the place that I keep thinking I'm defined by my past and the regret that I have from a decision I made 10 years ago, and I'm stuck in feeling guilty and ashamed. The people who are stuck because they're addicted to porn or pot or pain pills. The people who are stuck because their marriage is crumbled and they don't know what's next. The people who are stuck because they just can't be the kind of parent they thought they were gonna be. The people who are stuck because they're straight and relationships haven't worked out and they're confused or they're gay and relationships haven't worked out and they're confused. People who are stuck because they look and they go, I have a bunch of money and I still feel empty. People who are stuck because they say, every relationship I ever have fails. People who are stuck because they have the American dream and the suburban life and they're still a whole. People who are stuck because they're lonely because their kids are out of the house and their life was their kids. People who are stuck because they thought by now they'd have children and they're not even married and they haven't gotten what they thought life would be. And then people who are stuck because they look around and they go, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And the people who come to this place don't open the present like this. They rip it open as fast as they can because they know they need Jesus. So who are you? Is this whole, is it neat? Or is it necessity? Or maybe this is a Christmas where you go, man, I, I've come every single year and I've leaned and I've listened in because mom and dad said so. And I've been around church a bunch of times, but you've never actually come to the place where you said, I need it. I need the gift. I need to open the gift as fast as I can. I mean, it just comes down to, are you desperate for what God has freely given you? The perfect gift, the gift of himself, the gift that is personal, the gift that is lasting and the gift that is costly, the gift of a savior who offers eternity by way of grace. I'm gonna ask you to do something, just ask that you indulge, even if this isn't something you're hip to. I just want you to close your eyes for me right now. Just bow your head. And in this moment, as you ponder this, what we would say is good news, that God has offered the gift of his son to you. If you would say, I, I've never received that gift. I've never opened it. I've never said, I'm, I'm all in. Whether you're in one of the overflow rooms or you're watching this at some point online or you're in this space right now, what I wanna ask you to do is in a moment, I'm gonna count to three. And if you would say, I want that gift, I wanna open the gift of Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand. Not because it's magical, not because you have to do it, but because it's an act of faith of the posture of your body that says, I'm in, I believe this and I wanna follow Jesus. So if you've never done that for the first time, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand from your heart to God's being and say, I'm in. I don't even know all that it means, but I wanna be a Christian and I wanna follow you, God. If that's you on three, raise your hand. One, two, three, raise it up. Come on, put it up and hold it up. Keep them up. I wanna pray for you and I wanna pray for all of us. Father God, it's in this moment where we just pause and we're reminded that you promised you would pursue us. Christmas, the cross, Easter, all show that you have and do. So for these folks that have raised their hand right now, God, the Bible says that when you accept your son, that you become a new creation, that a party is thrown in heaven. So we celebrate with these new believers 
people who will try to figure out what it means to follow Jesus, may you guide them and direct them. And as we sing back to you right now, God, may we be reminded that you are an incredible savior, more than we deserve, who made a way when there wasn't a way and we worship you as our king. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.